Last week we were talking about relationships, friendship, and this week we're going to be talking about finances. And I know that's kind of a touchy subject. Uh, usually we don't want to talk about religion, politics, or finances. And um, you're in church today, so we're talking about religion. We'll leave politics off to the side for now, but we will talk about finances. And one of the things I want us to look at is a passage from Luke chapter 16. Um, it talks about the shrewd manager. Now, if any of you know anything about this text, you're probably thinking, Tim, are you nuts? Why would you choose this text to talk about a shrewd manager? The reason for that is, and I found this in, oh, I'm not on, uh, Helios, can you click me on there? Oh, there we go. All right, the reason for that is that um, one of the commentaries I was studying said this about this passage. He said, the interpretation of this parable is notoriously difficult. And I'm going like, okay, you know, are we gonna try and handle something that's really difficult? So why would I do this? Why would I wanna jump in and talk about this? And I think the reason is, is because it really has, oops, some very valuable lessons for us to grab a hold of. I mean, there's some really good stuff here. And so what we're going to try to do today, first of all, just kind of peel away some of the difficulty so we can really get into it, and then just kind of grab some of the lessons that are there for us to have to really hold on to, um, because there's some really good teachings here. So let's just kind of read the story, and then we'll look at some of the difficulties and then get into some of the lessons, all right? So here's the story. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. He replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Now, as we read through that, did you pick up any difficulties there? Anything kind of jump out at you? I mean, there are some statements there that you may kind of scratch your head about and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Well, to try and figure out what's going on, we need to come back and kind of look at the context. How is this parable? Where does it fit? What's going on here? And the first thing we want to ask is, okay, who was the audience? Who was Jesus telling this parable to? Now, you have to go back to chapter 15 to figure this out. Because at the beginning of chapter 15, it talks that he's talking to tax collectors and sinners. 
And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are there, and they're a little bit upset that Jesus is even talking with these people. So you have this audience. These people are with him. And then when you get to chapter 16, he's continuing on in the same, he's telling about four or five parables here. When you get to 16, it, it says specifically here that he was telling his disciples. But who was listening in? The Pharisees were still there listening in, and it says, you know, these are the guys, and he kind of gives a definition, who loved money. And now what are these parables that Jesus is telling in in Luke 15 and 16, if you go into chapter 17, and you'll find that through this, he's talking about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, the shrewd manager, and then the rich man and Lazarus. And in all of them, there's this idea of money and wealth, even with the lost sheep. I mean, he was willing to leave, you know, all of his herd to go after one. Now, that's not really good money management. You you wouldn't do that, okay? It's kind of like, no, you you worry about the 99. And so he's, all these things, the rich man and Lazarus, I mean, the lost coin, the lost son, he goes out and, you know, blows his dad's money, okay? So it's dealing with money. So all this is put together. And then as we get into this, we need to also take a look at you know, where do we see, you know, this, this difficulty? Well, the thing that just jumps out is what? Here is the master kind of, what, praising dishonesty? I mean, what's this guy doing? He's going out and he's cutting what people owe the master, and yet he is saying, good job, way to go. And I'm going like, what? Because it says what? He is... You know, the way the people get around this, and as they're reading it, a number of them said, okay, he's not really praising his dishonesty there, but he's praising him for acting shrewdly. And part of what will help us understand here, because we sometimes use this word shrewdly, you know, he's a shrewd businessman, um, kind of in a negative context, but here's really in a positive. The word literally means to be wise, wisely, with understanding, insight, pertain to understanding results from insight and wisdom. So the guy was smart. He was wise. And so the master is not necessarily, you know, saying his dishonesty, but acting shrewdly. And as I read that, as I thought about that, I go, but wait a minute. What was the guy doing? Wasn't he ripping off the master? Wasn't he kind of maybe going behind his back? You know, cheating what was really owed him. And then I came across a commentator who kind of put it together for me. And um, the guy's name is Joseph Fitzmaier, um, Roman Catholic um, professor, uh, taught in Washington, D.C., just passed this, he died just this past December, um, wrote a number of commentaries um, on the New Testament. And, and basically, that was his study. Uh, and so this is some of the comments that he made Um, from one of his commentaries. And what he did was, he said, okay, we need to look at it in the context of what was going on during Jesus' time. And he said, you need to understand that the way a manager was paid was often to charge a commission on a loan that the master had given. All right? We might call that interest. But as you know, in Jewish law, you cannot charge interest usury you can't do that it's wrong you can't so the way these guys would rationalize it kind of maybe get around it a little bit would say okay i'll loan you a thousand dollars but what you can do is give me back a thousand bushels of grain because now it's a commodity it's no longer money and hidden within that commodity that they give back is that when you give me back a thousand bushels of wheat, if I sell that, I get $1,500. You see? And so they kind of get around by doing this. And so that's how this professor was basically saying, that's what this manager was doing. What he was really doing was what? He was discounting the interest that he had put into it, or in a sense, his commission. And so in reality, at the end of the day, he was not taking anything away from the owner. He was taking away his cut. Does that make sense? And I go like, ah, so why did the master 
you know, commend him? It's because he wasn't losing any money. And besides, think about this. Hey, I'm looking pretty good here. I'm being pretty generous. I'm coming out all right. And the flip side is what? This manager was winning friends. Okay? I mean, come on. And if I cut your bill in half, you're going to be nice to me, right? You're going to be good. And so what do we have here? This is a win-win situation. I mean, everybody's happy. The owner, you know, this manager, even though he's getting fired, and the people who owe money. And it's just like a win-win situation. One of the commentators, this is from the um, Theological Exposition Bible Commentary, he said this, he said, the reason the manager was now commended, though he had previously acted dishonestly, may be that he had at least learned how one's worldly wealth can be wisely given away to do good. So you see, you begin to grab a hold of your, what is he commending him? He's not commending him for being dishonest, for cheating, for any of that, but maybe like, oh, so you're finally figuring out how to use worldly wealth to do good. Good on you, good on you. And that kind of comes through in that verse, that what he's doing, he's commending, yeah, this guy was dishonest, and that's why he's being fired. I mean, we have to understand that. But that he was really learning. And, and as I thought about that, I said, hey, listen, we can learn from people that we don't agree with. They can sometimes teach us something. What is he saying here? You know, the, the people of the world, you know, and the way they do business, you know, those of us who are Christians, we can learn some things from them. You know, we may not agree, we may not approve, but there may be some things there that we can learn. And so even though I don't necessarily agree with this dishonest, shrewd manager, there are some things that we can learn from him that can help us in really managing our finances. The first thing that we can learn from him is found there in verse 3, that he really looked ahead. What does he say? What shall I do now? Okay, what shall I do now? That we need to look ahead. And one of the things I see in our society today is that we never really look ahead. It's all about right here and now, right? We live for instant gratification. Ads come out and they say to get this and have this. You know, get it right now. I don't have the money. Not a problem. Not a problem. You get a year interest free loan. Pay us back at the end of the year. Just take it now. You can have it, right? 60 easy payments. Come on, you know, just get it right now. You don't have to have the money. Get it right now. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. If I can't afford it now, how am I going to afford it 60 months down the road? A year from now. You see, we get this idea that we can just get it and have it right now. And so I went through and I began to think, you know, as Canadians, how much money do you think on average we save? Okay, that we put aside for future year, for future use. How much? Anybody want to make a guess? 2%. That's a good guess. That's what I would have thought. And I was wrong. Okay? Now, this is the, I went through a bunch of statistics. Um, you know, Scats Can didn't really do a whole lot for me. But there was this company that kind of said, okay, let's look at what countries, on average, the people there put aside. And the way they did that was they looked at your disposable income, which means after all of your expenditures, after every, you spent everything, how much do you have left? Now, how much of that went into savings, I don't know, but this is the figure that they came up with. In 2015, Canadians saved 4.1%, which is pretty good. And then last year, it actually went up to 5.8. Now, I don't know what happened last year. Maybe we got more money back on our taxes. I don't know, but we did a little bit better. Okay, 4.1%. Americans actually did better than us, 4.9% in 2015. But here's the thing, Switzerland, 17.8%. They put that away. I'm going like, whoa, what's up with the Swiss? I mean, they're doing all right. And then I looked a little bit further down, okay, and I came to this little country called Denmark. 
You see the minus in front of it? <laughs> in other words, they spent 4% more than they made. I don't know how they did that, but that's what they did, okay? You know, we have this idea that, you know, we just need to spend it right now. But he is saying, no, wait, look ahead. Well, how do we do that? How do we save? How do we look ahead? Oh, what if we make a plan? And exactly that's what he did. What was his plan? I know what I'll do. I'll go out and I'll make sure that I connect with these guys so that when I don't have a job anymore, I have something out there. We need to make a plan. And what is a plan? Anybody, anybody have, you know, what's a financial plan? Budget, you got it, budget. That's all we gotta do is have a budget. You know, I mean, just figure out where's our money going? What are we doing with our money? And I think the worst financial situation we're in, I mean, if we're in debt up to our ears and we just can't make it, I mean, we're just kind of living from paycheck to paycheck, we need to have a pretty detailed budget, trying to figure out where's all this money going? How are we spending this? What are we doing? A rule of thumb, and this has been carried on. I mean, Rockefeller even mentioned this. He said, this is a rule of thumb. He said, you need to give 10% away, you need to save 10%, and you need to live off of 80%. It's called the 10, 10, 80 principle. 10, 10, 10, so you live off of 80. And people will basically say, wait a minute, I can't do that. I mean, I can't even live off of what I got now. Well, we gotta get it under control. You see, we have to make this plan, we have to do this. And, and, and what happens is, is that there's a killer out there that really destroys our budget. Anybody know what, what's the number one killer of a budget? Anybody wanna make, I know, you're gonna say spouse, but please, don't, don't say that, all right? We won't go there. Huh? Greed, well, yeah, greed does it. Your credit cards, yeah, they do that. But this is the one I saw, whoops. How come it didn't come up? Number one thing, it should be a sale, all right? The number one killer of a budget is a sale. You don't have any money for this, but it's on sale. You don't really need this, but it's on sale, okay? It'll destroy a budget every time. All right, maybe I got that further on, anyhow. So the other thing he did that we can learn from is that he acted on it right away. What did he do? As soon as he found out he was gonna be fired, he went out to work on trying to get things taken care of. And that's what we need to do. Sometimes we say, well, yeah, you're right, Tim. Someday, I need to really set up a budget, right? Someday, I'm gonna really get this under, guess what? Someday will never happen. It will never come. If we keep putting it off and just say someday, 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 it'll never happen. We need to make a plan and we need to act on it right away. And so we have to do these things. Now, these are some of the things that we can really learn from him. But there's also some things in this parable that we learn we're not to do with money. And the first thing is what? In verse one there, we are not to waste it. See, he was being fired because he was wasting